When I was in third grade, I lived in a little town called Newman, California. It was a tiny town. There was about 6,000 people living there, although it felt like six people sometimes. And we lived on 2230 Spring Court, Newman, California. Our, our home phone number uh, was 209-862-1807. But it was such a small town that you would just repeat when you're telling somebody your phone number, you would just say, oh, my phone number is 1807. Because it was such a small town, everyone had the same what is that called? Prefix? There's the area code, and then there's the three numbers. Nobody ever said the three numbers because everyone had the same. It was just 1807. It's amazing how almost 30 years later, I still remember those numbers. 2230 Spring Court, 862-1807. It's amazing what kind of gets ingrained into our minds, ingrained into who we are. I didn't even have to think for less than, I don't know, two seconds, and I came up with those numbers this week. Some of them may be used as my own passwords or PIN numbers. Don't don't take them anywhere. Don't tell anyone. (laughs) I just realized that. No, it's not a bank PIN, so we're good to go. Um, But don't try to, you know, forget password. Oh, Tim Gardner, he uses these numbers. No, don't do it. Don't do it. But it's amazing. Do you have numbers that just have, they're ingrained into your mind? It's a little bit harder these days with our phones. They're just there. But think way back to childhood, you probably remember some numbers from third grade. I also remember some other things from third grade. Uh, I played soccer in third grade, and I, well, it was my first time playing. (laughs) But I was okay. I had a coach. He was a, a high schooler. He lived across the street. And, uh, and one day, as we were kind of hanging out in our front yard, I know he, the coach who was in high school and his brother were talking, and I remember the word that he used when his brother said, hey, what do you think of Tim Gardner as a soccer player? Just like remembering 2230 Spring Court. Just like remembering 862-1807. I remember exactly the one word that he used. Sucks. <laughs> what? And I remember running into the house, screaming, crying, and it, I remember it to this day. You've ever heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me? That's a lie. <laughs> Absolutely a lie. There's nothing true about that. There's another lie, and it's this, actions speak louder than words. Okay, that's actually true. But it can, help, it can actually cause us to kind of get it a little bit askew because while actions speak louder than words is true, it doesn't mean that words don't matter. The reality is that the words that we use, the words that we hear, have the capacity to build each other up, to speak life into one another, or at the same time, it has the capacity, the words we use, the words we hear have the capacity to tear each other down and to destroy life. And that wasn't just true in Newman, California at 2230 Spring Court when I was in third grade. That's not just true now. It was true in the first century as the Christians were beginning to spread, as the news of Jesus was was going from region to region, and and people like Paul were, were speaking to churches. Paul, the apostle, he wrote a letter. It's called Ephesians. And he wrote this letter addressing some issues that people within a church were having. And in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 29, he says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Let me me read the first verse one more time. Verse 29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Paul is emphasizing unity. He's emphasizing the need to, uh, for believers to abandon their former ways, to get rid of the words that they used to use, and now speak with integrity, speak with kindness, speak with grace. And, and Paul here is he's specifically addressing Christians. 
He's specifically addressing people within the church, people who already know Jesus. And in verse 29, he addresses two truths. There are two truths here. The first is that there are words that can build others up. There are words that when you say them or when you hear them, they are life-giving. It makes others feel valued and cared for. The second truth here is that there are words that can tear down. Words that when spoken cause disappointment, fractions, and make other people feel less than cared for. I would guess that you know exactly what Paul's talking about right here. You can identify the words in your life that have been used with you that have torn you down. Uh, that you can't even hear that word today without some sort of painful memory that comes up for you. Man, I, as I was thinking through this sermon, the last thing that came to mind uh, as I was thinking through, okay, how are we going to open this? How are we going to set the stage? And the soccer, third grade soccer story came up. It was actually painful to think about. 30 plus years or almost 30 or whatever it works out to years later. You can probably also identify some words that have built you up. Words that they were spoken over you. And it was at a pivotal moment in your life. And you remember them to this day. And they still bring life to you even now. And Paul is urging his followers, the follower, or not his followers, but the followers of Jesus, to one, embrace words that edify. Embrace words that build up that give life to others according to what is needed in their specific circumstance or where they are in that situation. And then he kind of expands upon it in verse 32. He says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. So he's, he's asking the church, he's asking Christians, people who have followed Jesus, hey, speak words of life. And he's also tell, telling them, hey, avoid words that tear down. Avoid words that foul up the community. And we see this verse as, okay, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Okay, you don't want me to curse. Check. I won't use the Lord's name in vain. I won't use those four-letter words that I've been taught to, to not use as a Christian. You know, we just, I'll avoid that and we're good to go. But he, it's, it's not just curse words. He expands unwholesome talk. In verse 31, he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. This is sarcasm. This is sneers. This is cynicism, gossip, slander. Every language that tears down. And then in verse 30, he says something interesting. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. What a weird phrase. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It's kind of confusing, but in this context, it's pretty clear. Uh, to grieve in the Greek means to cause severe mental or emotional distress, to irritate, to offend, to insult. So when we use words that go against the life-giving nature of God, we're actually working against the Holy Spirit, who is often described as the encourager. When we use words of discouragement, we're working against Holy Spirit's job description, and we're causing grief to the, to the Spirit of God whose work it is to build up the body. So again, let, let's just read verse 29. Don't, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And I know what you're thinking. I do. You're thinking, that's great and all. That's a good verse. That's kind of wholesome. It sounds good. But Pastor Tim, have you ever lived life? <laughs> Aren't you married? Don't you have kids? Don't you drive on the same north way that I do? And yes, yes, I do. All the time. Except on Sunday mornings, let me tell you, at 7 a.m., it is the best time to drive on the north way because I can really lean into this verse of not letting any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth. It becomes really easy at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning when everyone's still in bed. But we live life, right? We live in a world. We live here and now. And, and so, yeah, following Paul's call to not let any unwholesome words come out of our mouth, that, that sounds great. 
But how do we actually use words that build up? How do we avoid using words that tear down? Can we go super practical today? Like super practical. Can we just like, how, what does this actually look like in your married relationships, with your dating, with your partner, with, with your kids, with your whoever it is in your life? Can we go super, can, will you allow us to go super practical? No? Okay, we're done then. <laughs> Somebody say yes. Thank you. Okay. We're going super practical here today, and so I hope you buckle up. We're going into the Ten Commandments of Communication. Ready for this? If you were in premarital counseling here at Grace, if you sit down and you're like, hey, we're having problems in our marriage, I'm going to say, great, talk to a counselor. <laughs> this is so good. And, and from counseling, you might get some of these ideas. And so if you have ever had an argument, if you've ever had a child not obey you, Take out a pencil and a paper and write, take some notes because, again, super practical today. First commandment of communication is, and these aren't from the Bible, they're biblical, but it's not the Ten Commandments because the first one is, thou shalt not be distracted. Seems like common sense, um, but what does that mean about communication? Man, when we're communicating with others, and we have our phone in our hands, looking at the TV, doing our, like, doing our own thing, AirPods in, whatever the case may be. If there's any point of distraction, our communication is going to suffer. That means when we communicate with others, especially in communication that's surrounding conflict, we need to minimize as much as possible to give ourselves a better chance to hear what's actually being said and to say what is actually in our hearts. So that one's simple. Thou shalt not be distracted. Number two, thou shalt not vent publicly. I'll say it again. Thou shalt not vent publicly. You can vent privately, but you shouldn't vent publicly. There's a blog post from a, a guy, a pastor, and author named Kerry Newhoff this last week, and he wrote about this a little bit, and he actually pointed to Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was known as this, like, even-keeled kind of guy. He, he was all about unity and all about building others up and bringing the country together, right? And he had a practice of writing what he called, or historians call, hot letters. Lincoln, again, was known for this kind of calm demeanor. But when he had an argument with someone, when he felt slighted by someone, when there was an offense, he would write letters that we shouldn't read aloud in a church. <laughs> and he would put them aside. And he would let it, let it sit. He would vent privately. But when he turned around and actually talked to that person, he wouldn't vent to them. Or, hey, newsflash, he wouldn't vent about them to others. Fascinating. Uh, the King David from the Old Testament, he did the same thing. He, throughout the Psalms, talked about other people. And I love this. Psalm 109 says, May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. That's kind of harsh, <laughs> Right? But I can imagine he wrote this down as a prayer to God. It was just him and God. It was just him in this private moment of venting and lamenting and crying out. And he didn't turn and go talk about this person with other people. He didn't turn and go to them and say, hey, I hope your mother never has her sins forgiven. What, like, what? Who's going to say that? But he said it to God privately, just so happens we get to, to read it publicly. <laughs> He's dead. It's okay. Um, so thou shalt not vent publicly in order to build one another up because your words matter. Okay, that's number two. Here's number three. Thou shalt not cast all the blame. It's like the saying, um, when you're pointing one finger, you have three pointing back at you. <laughs> uh, even if the other person is at 98% at fault, there's probably still 2% of blame that it lands on you. I love what Jesus says to his followers. Take the plank out of your own eye before you address the speck in your neighbor's eye. Don't cast all the blame until you've also owned what you can own. This is huge. 
And I'm going to give you kind of 3A. This is commandment 3. Here's 3A, which is kind of like the subset. It's a bonus for you. Uh, it, this is, thou shalt not use sarcasm to hurt others. Even if you are just the sarcastic person, and everyone in your workplace knows it, everyone in your family knows it, you, that's just your personality, your sense of humor. It actually can come across as critical or disapproving. You might think you're joking. Meanwhile, everyone else is going to go into defense mode because they're hearing blame masked as humor. That's just a bonus. That's just a freebie for today. It's, the, it's really worth the price of admission, which was nothing, but hey, there you go. Um, I, I really like Psalm 141.3 as a prayer, a, as a way to kind of like center yourself in this moment. When you, when you just want to cast blame, when you just want to like vent publicly, when you just want to do whatever you need to do to make sure that person hears or you get back at them, say this prayer. Psalm 141.3 says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Man, that's a game changer in our communication. If we simply prayed that verse prior to engaging in conflict, thou shalt not cast all the blame in order to build each other up with your words because your words matter. How are we doing? Good? Okay. I feel like we need to shift from thou shalt not because that's just too hard to say and it's negative. So let's go to the positive. The rest of them are going to be good. The rest of them are thou shall, okay? So it's going to be the what we should do instead of what we shouldn't do, because I like hearing that better than what we shouldn't do. So this is the next one. Number four, thou shall use I statements. If you've ever done premarital counseling here at Grace in the last number of years, you've heard this over and over again because it's so important. There's two phrases I'll read. The first one is this. You made me so angry when you did this. Here's the second phrase. I felt really angry when you did this. Of course, I inflected my voice a, a little bit differently, but those, even though they sound pretty similar, are completely different. One of them is casting blame. Blaming someone for the feelings that you're experiencing versus the second one, I, I feel angry is you're taking ownership and responsibility for your own feelings. Using I statements, using feeling statements, focuses on your own feelings in the midst of a discussion or an argument. Thou shall use I statements in order to build each other up with your words because words matter. Here's number five. Thou shall listen with empathy. I heard a, a definition of empathy uh, from a pastor a number of years ago. And it's this, empathy is the ability to press pause on your own thoughts and feelings long enough to explore someone else's thoughts and feelings. It's the, I'll read it again, the uh, ability to press pause on your own thoughts and feelings long enough to be able to explore someone else's thoughts and feelings. It's to press pause long enough to be able to, to understand a little bit better about where they're coming from. What is it like to be them? What's it like to be in their situation, in, in their circumstance? You can say, what is it like to walk in their shoes? You might not want to put their shoes on. They might not fit. It's kind of an analogy, but don't actually like try on. Other, hey, we're in an argument. Let me try your shoes. Don't do that. But what is it like to walk in their shoes, to walk in the ways that they walk, the places they walk, to be in the, the community or the family that they're in? What's it like to be them? I love the Stephen Covey quote. Uh, he, he says, seek first to understand, not to be understood. How often do we, in, <laughs> in our culture, just want to be understood for our own ideas, feelings, and contexts? And, and so often we fail to recognize that, man, I should actually be first trying to figure out what it looks like to be in their shoes, to understand their circumstances. So the next time we're speaking with someone that you disagree with or someone who's dealing with something difficult, ask yourself, what is it like to be them, to walk in their shoes? Do you know that God knows what it's like to walk in our shoes, in the person of Jesus? And if we're followers of Jesus, we should also be trying to figure out if we love others as Christ loved us, maybe I should figure out 
what it looks like to be them for a moment as I explore what it's like, what they're coming, where they're coming from, how they're living. And I honestly believe that our inability to, to be empathetic, our inability to walk in other people's shoes, even just for a moment, uh, is one of the biggest issues in America today. I, I honestly be, I believe that our inability in our society to explore the thoughts and feelings of someone on the other side of the aisle is tearing this country apart. We can change the way that we interact with people. We can change the way that we parent our kids, the way that we grow with our friends, the way that we choose to respond to people on social media, and even the way that we minister to people in our communities. Thou shalt listen with empathy in order to build each other up with our words, because words matter. Here's number seven, or no, number six, I jumped ahead. Thou shalt practice teamwork. Again, premarital counseling, if you've ever been in it, if you're ever going to be in it, this is something that we talk about, and it's a simple triangle. And it's really quick, we'll talk about this one quickly, but it's not because it's not important. It's actually hugely important. Make conflict about a specific action or situation, not a person. It's not triangle here. It's not me versus you because of the problem. It's me and you versus the problem. Do you get that? It's me and you on a team together versus a problem. It's me, it's not me and versus my wife because of our finances. It's me and my wife versus our finances. It's not me versus our kids because of their grades. It's me and my kids versus their grades. As semantics, I know, and it, 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 it kind of sounds simple, but if we unpack that, if you practice that in your life, it is a game changer. Thou shalt practice teamwork in order to build each other up with your words because words matter. Here we go. Number seven. You ready? Thou shalt practice immense patience. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. For that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, this is Paul talking, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his immense patience. Not just a little bit of patience. Not just majority patient, but immense patience. I was a um, camp counselor at a middle school uh, well, I was actually an intern at this church, and we went camping, and it was like legit tent camping with middle schoolers. No. <laughs> Please don't ever do that. Um, <laughs> tent camping with middle schoolers. Uh, it, man, you talk about I need some more patience in my life. That is the place that God can grow all the patience, or you ultimately fail in, in being patient. Uh, there were these two middle school students who were kind of the I don't like camping kids. And I know that because they told us every three minutes. And we were going on a three-mile hike, which, again, three miles, that's not a big deal. We've gone on multiple miles with my kids. They're not even in middle school yet. But for these two kids, these two middle school kids who hate camping, three miles was a marathon. And according to them, it was uphill both ways. And I laid there in my sleeping bag out under the stars because the middle schoolers had the tents. We had stars. It was just better that way. Um, and I prayed, which never, never pray this prayer. <laughs> God, give me patience with these two middle schoolers. Man, God gave me an opportunity for patience the next day as we're hiking, walking. I call it a, a, a simple stroll through the woods. Uh, they call it hiking Everest, and it was these two middle schoolers who were falling behind, and it was given, the task was given to me by the head counselor. Hey, Tim, why don't you just hang back with them and make sure that they don't get, you know, lost. Great. Great. <laughs> it's the worst possible situation to be in. Like, I just, let's just go and know they are complainers. And yet, we had a lot of fun. I just took a deep breath. I continued to ask for patience that day. And we saw things that we would not have seen if we were hiking with the rest of the group. 
we experienced nature and we got to see animals that the big group scared them off, but we, it was fun. It was hard, but it was good. And, and that's the kind of patience that I believe God has with us. It's difficult when he looks down on us and sees, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why are you thinking that? Why are you acting that way? And yet he continues to display his immense patience with us. God practiced immense patience with Paul, and God practices immense patience with me. God practices immense patience with you. Thou shalt practice immense patience with one another in order to build each other up with your words because words matter. Here's number eight. And number eight, a little bit, is an application of number seven, and it's this. Thou shalt assume the best possible scenario. I mentioned the, the North Way earlier and driving on, on uh, 87. It doesn't matter what way you're going in, and there's always somebody who just zooms past you, and you hope that cop is hiding out over there because you just want them to get caught, right? Maybe that's you, and you're hoping that, anyway. Um, we naturally fill in the story. Our brains fill in the gaps, and we come to conclusions about who they are and what they're about. They are absolute idiots who just don't know how to drive, and they, like, they're, they're in a rush, and obviously they are an horrible person, and I'm so much better than they are. Man, let that, and that's always the conclusion we come to more often than not. We need to assume the best possible scenario. What does that look like? Well, I wonder if that's a husband who just got a call from his wife who, whose water broke, and he's trying to get home to take her to the hospital. Well, I wonder if, if she's test driving a used car, and she's just trying to get push it to its limits, which I'm not saying that's okay to do, but maybe she's just trying to make sure that this is the right car for her. Maybe that's the best possible scenario in this situation. We have a knife block at home, and I didn't tell my wife I was selling this today. Can I tell the story? Sweet. Okay, good. Um, we have a knife block at home, and in my mind, there's always the right way to load the knife block, because you, all, you have that one knife that you always pull. Like, it's your go-to, right? It's the, it's the bigger one. It starts bigger here, and it goes down to a point here, and it's really good for chopping. And I mean, it's, it's just the, the best knife in the whole knife block. And in my mind, it belongs in the top slot because I always want to know. I'm grabbing the top slot. It is my knife. It's the one that I want to use. There was a season in our marriage <laughs> when my wife didn't put that knife in the top slot. And every time I would grab my knife, it was always the one that doesn't come to the point. It just stays large. You know what I'm talking about? And every time I'm thinking, man, what is she doing? She's doing this on purpose. What is she thinking? She's trying to spite me. Like, she's, she's just doing this because I did something to her, and it's like, pfft. See, isn't it good to know that the pastor, the campus pastor of this church, is not perfect. It's so good. I completed the story loop in my mind. My brain gave me some, uh, some like, good shots of feeling because I completed this story, and I came to the, to the conclusion that my wife just hates me. Our brains automatically complete stories in order to deal with difficult emotions and process confusing, confusing events. Unfortunately, this leads our brains to tell stories that are often not true. And in turn, we respond to the person or situation in question in an inappropriate manner. My wife had no idea that I loved that knife in that top sl slot. I never told her. We never talked about it. That was the best possible scenario. We had a conversation, and it's never been the same since. Until this week when her mother was here and her mom put the top knife wrong. But that's okay. We're, we won't go there. Um, she, again, she doesn't know. It's not that she hates me. Instead of jumping into conclusions and responding in inappropriate ways, why don't we complete the loop in our minds in their favor with the best possible scenario? By the way, that's a great game to play in the car with your kids. Somebody's driving erratically. Hey, kids, what do you think that person's doing in the best possible scenario? It just trains us to think differently. Thou shalt practice 
assuming the best possible scenario in order to build each other up because your words matter. Here's number nine. Thou shall give yourself a time out. You'll never hear the following statement. We keep fighting and fighting and yelling and screaming, and eventually we solve the problem. That doesn't happen. One of the most significant tools you can use in a relationship is to implement the ability to take time out. I'm not talking about little kids, like, okay, go to your corner, sit in the littlest chair, turn around, face the wall, no tech, like, that's not what I'm talking about. This looks like someone taking time away from an argument to think, process, and allow yourself to calm down. Uh, it, something happens physiologically when we're in an ar argument. Our palms sweat, our muscles tense, demeanor and tones change. The fight or flight response in our brain is activated and we're no longer behaving in rational ways. We feel attacked, we, our defenses go up, and our st instinctual need for defense kicks in. We've put ourselves into a situation where many would say they're no longer, they no longer feel in control of the words that you're using. And in Ephesians 4.26, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Man, this is a dangerous place to be in. So give yourself a timeout. Side note, don't give your spouse a timeout. <laughs> it, it would work completely opposite if you said, okay, no, you time out now. <laughs> no, 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 give yourself a timeout. Have the conversation today about like, hey, can, should we implement the ability to give ourselves timeouts? And figure out what that looks like for you in whatever relationships you have. I, I love the quote from uh, the, the communication and business book called Crucial Conversations. It says, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> Isn't that true? Okay, thou shalt give yourself a time out to build others up with your words because words matter. Here's number 10 final commandment of communication. Thou shalt recognize that God is holding it all together, not you. Sometimes I wonder if the words we use to tear others down is because we have a misunderstanding of who's really in control. We use discouraging words towards a family member because we, maybe even subconsciously, we don't really know what's happening, but we want to show our dominance in the relationship. We gossip about an, uh, someone in our small group or in a, a significant relationship because we want to convince ourselves that we're better than they are. We put someone down because we want to control the outcomes of a situation. And this is what I think we so often forget. We're not in control. And all the words, attitudes, and actions will never be able to put us in the place of God who is ultimately the one who holds all things together. We're not holding all things together. But somewhere in our heart, we've convinced ourselves that we've got this. That if, if we can control the situations, if we can control the people in our, around us, in our families, in our small groups, in our, in our church, then we can control the outcomes. And maybe... That's just one of the reasons our words aren't always used for building others up. I, I love what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says, A good man brings good things out of, his, out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Therefore, if your heart is full of the lie that you, you're, that you are in control or that you need control, then your mouth will do whatever is necessary to find some sort of control in your life. So thou shall recognize that God is holding it all together, not you, in order to build others up according to their needs because words matter. And here's the thing. We don't need one more list of things to do and to not do. We don't need one more law to follow Jesus. We don't need one more 
set of things that we have to abide to and, and, and make sure that we're, we're hitting the mark. These are simply all applications of the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's a further explanation of what it means to love God and love others, to love others as God has loved you. So let me just take a moment and talk to those in the room, if you're here, uh, who are still on the fence about this whole Jesus thing. If you don't call yourself a Christian today, everything we just talked about, these 10 commandments of communication, it's just a suggestion, but it's not required. I mean, if you put these things into practice, the things that Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, if you put it into practice in your daily life, you will find that this biblical text will actually make your life better. It will, but it's not required. There's no biblical mandate for those who are outside the family of God to follow the moral laws laid out in Scripture. So you do you and have fun. But if you follow Jesus. If you follow this biblical call to use your words carefully, you'll find that if you're a Christ follower, this is not just a suggestion. If you follow Christ, this isn't just a good moral teaching. This is part of our sanctification, which is it's a big word that simply means closing the gap between what we profess, what we say we believe, and the way that we're living. Simply put, it, it's so sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. Therefore, as, as part of playing out the great commandment to love God, to love others, we've got to be obedient to this. We've got to listen to this. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, alive and active within us, we need to follow Paul's imperative call to make sure that the words we're using are beneficial and not harmful. So that, so that the world would see that we, the way that we talk to each other as the church, our unity in Christ. And like Jesus' prayer in, in John 17, he prays for the church, to followers of Jesus, to be one. They would see the way that we talk. They would see our unity. And they would respond by praising our Father in heaven. Imagine a world in which the church of Jesus Christ encouraged and built one another up. Imagine a world in which we understood that our words matter. Imagine a world where soccer coaches never tore down, where third graders were only encouraged, it can make a huge difference. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we ask that you would help us to respond to your words. You would help us to understand what you're teaching us today through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. God, we would ask that you would help us to put this into practice by the power of your Holy Spirit because the reality is, God, we can't do this alone. There's no way we could measure up. There's no way we can follow the, the things you call us to if it weren't for the power of your Spirit within us. So God, give us your grace and your power. Remind us of your truth so that people would see the way that we talk to our spouse, the way that we talk to our kids, the way that we talk to our community, the way that we respond to people on social media. God, give us the ability to shine your light in this world. Give us the ability to always encourage, build up, and speak life. Because God, that's what you did for us. We thank you for the example of Christ. We thank you for the grace given to us through Christ. And we ask that that grace would continue to change us day in and day out for your glory. Amen.